Um, Just so I'm Max Gunsberg, Assistant Professor of Humanities in the Hamilton Center for Classical and Civic Education. The Hamilton Center's core mission is to help students develop the knowledge, habits of thought, analytical skills, and character to be citizens and leaders in a free society. We aim to achieve this by carrying out cutting-edge research, developing academic programs that focus on the Western intellectual and political tradition, as well as the ideals of the American founding. As part of our mission, we invite world-leading scholars to share with us their research on a variety of topics, including great thinkers and the great books. And if you're interested in our events, there's an email list you can sign up for to, to the left um, as, you, as you enter the room. It's a great pleasure for me and for us to introduce Professor Richard Burke from the University of Cambridge. It's a particular pleasure for me since I've known him for a very long time, 11 years to be precise. I knew him first as a devoted and inspirational teacher at the Queen Mary University of London, where he taught me in um, the history of political thought. And like everyone who ends up in academia, I owe a lot to my teachers and to my mentors, and I more, owe more to, to Richard than to, to anyone else. And that is not just me, but generations of um, students and scholars who have been taught uh, by Richard in London as well as in Cambridge, and who now work on both sides of the Atlantic. Many have a cause to thank him, but few can be as grateful as, as I am. And in my case, I've also been especially fortunate because he has become a dear friend along, along the way. But it's of course as a scholar that Professor Burke is best known. The Hamilton Center is a multi and interdisciplinary center, um, and Professor Richard Burke is clearly an ideal speaker for us because he has worked in um, almost all the fields we are covering. So he has degrees in English literature, in philosophy, and in classics, and he has pursued his vocation within history and political theory. And he's devoted his, his career and his life to the study of great books and the intellectual worlds of great thinkers. He's now a professor in the Faculty of History in Cambridge, where he holds the prestigious chair in the history of political thought, and is also a fellow of the British Academy. Very few scholars can boast such a range of topics that Professor Burke has mastered during the course of his career. His first book was titled Romantic Discourse and Political Modernity, a study in British Romanticism, published in 1993. He then followed up with Peace in Ireland, The War of Ideas, published in 2003, a um, path-breaking work on the Troubles in Northern Ireland, which shifted attention away from religious tribalism to democratic and political strife. Professor Burke is perhaps best known for his book, Empire and Revolution, The Political Life of Edmund Burke, from 2015, an award-winning and highly acclaimed book, which is doubtlessly the gold standard as far as scholarship from Edmund Burke, is, uh, as far as scholarship from Edmund Burke goes. He has also edited volumes on subjects such as popular sovereignty, political judgment, the history of modern Ireland, the political thought of the Irish Revolution, and most re recently he co-edited with Quentin Skinner a volume called History and Humanities and Social Sciences, which came out earlier in 2023. But rather astonishingly, this is not his main book of the year. His new monograph has just come out with Princeton University Press, and it is, in many ways, an entirely new departure for Professor Burke, as, as you would expect from him. It's on the German 19th century philosophical giant Hegel, and it's called Hegel's World Revolutions, a book I cannot highly recommend enough, and it is possible to purchase it uh, after uh, Professor Burke's lecture. He's also going to sign copies, uh, and I believe he's already signed a, a few of them. So Hegel is also the subject of Professor Burke's lecture for us today. The title of his lecture is Hegel and Liberalism. So without further ado, over to you, Professor Burke. The stage is yours. Well, it's uh, terrific being in Florida for, for the first time. First time, therefore, also at Gainesville. Um, I'm really delighted and touched by that very warm and generous introduction. Uh, so thanks to you, Max. Thanks also to Robert Ingram for his invitation originally. Um, my thanks also to Will Imberden for um, 
hosting me in a generic sense here th this evening. So, liberalism is an ambiguous word within our culture. Its meaning is divergent for a start on either side of the Atlantic. Equally, uh, liberalismus, the German, uh, liberalisme, the French and numerous other derivative versions in any number of languages, they don't perfectly overlap in their meaning. Uh, I think one might easily proliferate these meanings also uh, indefinitely. Therefore, academic work remains to be done on whether this is one or many concepts, and I suspect it's, it's many. Even in an exclusively Anglophone context, how the original term um, relates to its subsequent employment remains to be established, at least definitively, um, by research. Having said this, my aim this evening is not to explore the meanings of liberalism, which would go on for many volumes and certainly beyond uh, an evening's lecture. Instead, I want to examine some elements of the concept as these were analysed in the thought of Hegel. Uh, for his part, Hegel never described himself as, uh, as a liberal, which causes problems uh, of its own, although he did deploy the term. He associated liberalism actually with a kind of atomism. In fact, that's his word. More specifically, he conceived of it as a system of entitlements uh, imposed by modern constitutions which conferred individual rights but without government accountability. So that's his conception. As the example of the Napoleonic regimes across Europe showed, and it was these that he was principally analysing, he lived through the French Revolution and the Napoleonic conquest of Europe, um, such um, arrangements often lacked popular allegiance as well. The conquest of Spain is the obvious example. The Spanish didn't like uh, Napoleon. Well, for this reason, if you can pardon the paradox, liberalism for Hegel was actually illiberal. So by the end of the first third of the 19th century, Hegel's conception of liberalism was just one view amongst many. In other words, what the word referred to was evidently disputed. The sense of the term, as we now say, was essentially contested. Nonetheless, currently, we tend to associate liberalism with a, with a range of characteristics, so it's not so polysemic as to be meaningless. From an historical point of view, I think it's important not to confuse the origin of liberal values with their subsequent development. I mean, that's history 101. You don't confuse the sources with the outcome. Um, it's, it's equally vital not to collapse the process of their, for, of their formation um, into the final product, also a standard non-teleological historical procedure. But it's still, nonetheless, useful to enumerate key features of liberalism um, which most would agree <coughs> are relevant parts of the phenomenon today. By most estimates, these features include characteristics associated with the um, Rechtsstaat, we're in America, so I'll just say Rechtsstaat, um, as well as principles covered by the notion of uh, a free society. Altogether, this adds up to a composite idea uh, comprising elements like a cohesive state, I mean, without that you can't have liberalism, a representative regime, rights of property, a civil society, the rule of law, uh, the separation of powers, the toleration of dissent, and the principle of choice in professional and family life. But crucially, liberalism also presupposes the authority of reason over religious dogma and over the political uh, enforcement of opinion. This last commitment is a bequest of the Age of Enlightenment. According to Hegel, Enlightenment favoured norm-based judgments uh, for which standards of proof were independent of the mere status of the judge. It followed that Enlightenment assumed a capacity for impartiality, 
giving uh, rise to the possibility of fair treatment. Now, the Kantian injunction, the injunction from his essay, uh, What is Enlightenment?, the injunction sapere aude, that's to say, dare, dare to know, uh, this notion included defiance of authority um, regarding matters of truth. It traded on the legitimacy of rational criticism against the dictates, if you like, of raw power. Combining these um, Enlightenment and Rechtsstaat strands together uh, may or may not add up to the complete package that most of us call liberalism, but they are nonetheless components, at least, of liberal ideology, even if they don't constitute uh, the complete article. So, in my lecture today, I want to examine both the political and cultural conditions of Hegel's conception of a Rechtsstaat. A Rechtsstaat signifies a rule-based, well, a, a rights-based state is the translation, but uh, a rule-based regime, let's say. It assumes uh, that government and its officers are subject to regulation uh, while the population over which it presides are treated equally before the law. Thus, the idea has various constitutional dimensions as well as socio-legal preconditions. In this lecture, therefore, I begin by offering an overview of Hegel's constitutional theory and the historical vision that comes along with it, incidentally. I shall then discuss his conception of enlightenment. For Hegel, both enlightenment and constitutionalism were broadly constitutive of European modernity. For this reason, rationalism, the Rechtsstaat, and a free society go together in Hegel's conception of the highest achievements of the modern world. A crucial aspect of Hegel's analysis of modernity is his account of the transition from feudal governance, feudal Herrschaft in, in the original, to constitutional monarchy. This development was charted under the rubric of Bildung in the Geist section of the Phenomenology of Spirit. So in the Phenomenology of Spirit, there's a large section on Geist, Spirit, and within that there's a treatment of Bildung, we might say culture, which charts this historical transition from basically feudalism to uh, 19th century constitutionalism. But the details set out there uh, were further elaborated in uh, the, his philosophy of history or philosophy of world history, a, a lecture series now published as a book. There, in that work, the, the change was presented in terms of um, his phrase, the, the breaking of arbitrary will among competing lords and vassals. This led to the concentration, or in his phrase, unification of power. We say centralization of the state function. By this, Hegel meant the emergence of supreme authority vested in the state under which particular, by which he meant private, exemptions were eliminated. We'd say the elimination of special privileges under a centralized state. Um, members of the state uh, came to enjoy, as we might say, universal rights. For Hegel, it was actually Frederick the Great who was both a champion and represented the near, though not complete, culmination of this arrangement. Under the feudal order, what Hegel termed the dynastic principle had reigned. Obligations were personal and their enforcement depended on either patronage or violence, never duty based on general norms. The arbitrariness of feudal entitlements produced a stark confronta confrontation between lord and serf or herr and knecht uh, in the German, which is the master slave, the same phraseology as master and slave, a subordination of slave to master in the absence of, of principled accommodation. It was characterized by struggle instead of a system of obligations, and so it yielded what Hegel called uh, a polyarchy, um, a phrase picked up to be something completely by Robert Dow in the 20th century, incidentally. So rival contestants were motivated by honor Competitive system, a competitive system of honour instead of serving the common good. 
in Hegel's phrase, modern monarchy supplated or overcame or dialectically superseded this essentially anarchical combination of forces. Vassalage gave way to distinct orders in the state, which came together to form a constitutional settlement. Estates and corporations prospered without pulling the regime apart, if you like. Equally, serfdom and domination were replaced by regular government, dedicated to the, to the maintenance of generalized rights and standards. During this process, uh, crucially, state officials took the place of competing dynasts. Altogether, these, um, these changes promoted a shared allegiance to the public wheel. So, uh, you know, patriotism rather than local um, allegiance. Over time, the state appeared as a properly universal authority, displacing the older structure of contractual principalities. He had in mind the Holy Roman Empire, you know, a dysfunctional, non-centralized, uh, centripetal state. He lived through its disintegration, of course. So while under feudal conditions, each territory might exercise external sovereignty, internally, competing powers rendered uh, the polity an aggregate rather than an integrated organism. As clearly, impl as already implied, Hegel believed that the passage from feudal to constitutional monarchy was one of the great achievements of European history, i.e. a lot better than what went before. While the development was based upon the consolidation of a powerful executive, drawing together uh, the elements of so society into a state, it also presupposed the, presupposed the emergence of civil society, his phrase, um, Bürgerliche Gesellschaft. The concept is one of the elements of our notion of uh, a free society. So the creation of civil society, Hegel announced in his great work of um, 1821, The Philosophy of Right, um, as he put it, it belongs to the modern, to the modern world. In Hegelian taxonomy, Civil society was distinguished from uh, society and from the state, as both these had been theorized in, the, um, in earlier traditions of natural law. The category, the category didn't simply refer to uh, a natural association prior to the institution of government, i.e. society before the state. Neither was it equivalent to what um, Hegel thought of as the higher or more fully integrated sphere of political society, i.e. the state itself. Rather, civil society in his usage um, denoted commercial interaction secured by a system of laws, something like a market society, you might say, or needs-based relations constrained by judicial regulations. Since ancient societies were supported by slave economies, with communities differentiated into political and family life, the polis and the, and the oikos, there was no classical equivalent to civil society. Equally, civil society was contrasted by Hegel with the more capricious forms of social exchange which he associated um, with um, typical feudal society arrangements. For instance, neither the hospitality, uh, deference, nor personal fidelity characteristic of vassalage were features of specifically civil society. So under Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, or civil society, members pursued their own ends uh, freely, hence my analogy with market society. And the goals they aimed at served particular interests, their own individual interests. With that purpose in view, each individual satisfied their desires by relying on others as a means to that objective. Individual gratification, in his phrase, was mediated by the form of universality. So our individual um, interactions nonetheless have implications uh, for the whole. Self-interested actors <coughs> stood in a relation of interdependence with others. This interdependence had to be distinguished from uh, fealty, since it was conducted in terms of individual rights based on property and contract and enforced through punishment. Hegel contended that the appearance of civil society was connected to the rise of the citizen, 
or in, in, in the German, the Burger, hence the Burgerliche Gesellschaft, in the sense of bourgeois, uh, which is where we get our concept of bourgeois and bourgeoisie. Remember, Marx was a student at one remove of Hegel's. Uh, so in the sense of bourgeois rather than a citoyen, rather than state citizen. This social type was first produced, it's, in other words, its, its historical origins lay in the medieval towns, which subsisted in the midst of uh, the feudal countryside. So this is the his historical origin of modern market societies. The role of the towns in the development of modern liberty was a theme explored in the philosophical histories stretching from Adam Smith uh, in the 18th century to Francois Guizot in the 19th. Hegel certainly drew on the relevant Scottish sources. We know this. Uh, he wrote a manuscript on James Stewart, the Scottish uh, political economist, early in his career. The manuscript has been lost, and there is hope that someday a scholar will rediscover it. But anyway, um, so too uh, did uh, Guizot, for whom Europe was in part a product of the enduring uh, municipal spirit which the Roman Empire had bequ bequeathed to uh, the surviving era. So the towns are really the survival of bits of Rome after, the, uh, after its decline in the midst of feudal um, inundation. Well, in the third book of The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith associated modern freedom with the rise of commerce and manufacturers. He went on to ascribe this insight to David Hume, uh, his friend and in many ways teacher, who had canvassed the thesis in his essays as well as in his historical work, The History of England. Smith connected the argument to the history of um, European cities as they revived after the collapse of, of Roman power. The inhabitants of towns and cities, although at first subject to exploitation, gradually carved out a measure of autonomy from the surrounding area. So-called free burghers, uh, liberated from the arbitrary imposition of, uh, impositions of barons, created orderly conditions under which commerce could prosper. Over time, the institutions of municipal government took root, further guarante guaranteeing security of rights. Uh, and these, again, favoured the pursuit of commerce, following James Stewart, Adam Ferguson, John Millar and William Robertson, various uh, Scottish political economists uh, and historians of the 18th century, Hegel addressed this subject in his philosophy of history. Like the church, Hegel contended, cities emerged as part of a reaction against feudal exploitation, facilitating, facilitating the establishment of right, recht, in the midst of wrong, unrecht. The principle of free possession, property as we would say, which had prospered before the cons consolidation of feudalism, emerged again in cities created in the feudal era. Hegel concluded, the essence of freedom and order has therefore arisen mainly in towns. This ultimately led to the formation of early modern republics in Italy, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Germany and France. But the resulting republican norms, which secured justice under regulated governments, came to characterize early modern monarchies as well. By degrees, bourgeois or burgerlich societies were formed. Under their influence, subjectivity in, in all its um, dimensions uh, dominated uh, custom. The impact of this principle was felt in various domains and gradually and over time including, of course, contractual relations, moral ideas, professional life, and even the family. It followed that for Hegel, among the most conspicuous features of modern history was the gradual unburdening of what he called personality, or the rights-bearing individual, we, we would call it, uh, during the progress of European social development. Hegel tackled this theme under the rubric of the right of persons, referring to the entitlement to property and contractual relations generally. The polar opposite of personality was slavery, the alienation of personality, uh, this constituting an, an unsurpassed, as far as he was concerned, an unsurpassed abomination in world history. He wasn't in favour of slavery. Uh, you can take it as read. Hegel wrote, 
It is only because I am alive as a free entity within my body that this living existence may not be misused as a beast of burden. Okay, so the important point is you are, you are a self-possessor of yourself, and that is why you are a human being and not a slave. What's important, in other words, is the history of the mind, unlike in modern fashionable histories, the history of the body, animals, of bodies. We have something else. We are free. A proper understanding of this principle meant that ownership had to be free and complete. Hegel used this insight to criticize confused ideas about property, which he associated at once with Roman jurisprudence, an underdeveloped conception of property as far as he was concerned, all forms of communalism, an interesting fact given the Marxian derivation from Hegel. Uh, Hegel was not a communist. Uh, feudal relations, he was clearly against those, and also a criticism of the Kantian conception of rights, because rights weren't absolute in Hegel. They were fundamental and necessary, but they didn't cancel all other social obligations, importantly. So the person, as Hegel saw it, the rights-bearing individual, as I've said, had to be uh, freed from status relations and differentiated from membership of a family. At the same time, Hegel contrasted personality with the, uh, with, uh, the feudal notion of dependence Partial and divided property, so uh, estates in fief, uh, usufructs, and entails, were all corruptions of the notion of unfettered ownership, according to Hegel. <coughs> Under contemporary Prussian reforms, uh, limitations of the kind were, for the most part, disappearing. That's his statement. They were, for the most part, disappearing in, in his own era. Modernity was liberating the rights-bearing personality <coughs> This laid the foundation for the current conception of a professional vocation, um, along with the institution of the conjugal family. Hegel sees all these things as interconnected. This meant that the conditions which yielded the rise of inalienable and imprescriptible rights um, likewise freed the individual from predetermined social roles. In broad terms, this shift differentiated Eastern and Western societies as well as the ancient from the modern world. Schematically, Sparta and India from Germany and France. In the latter cases, allocation to estates was not uh, rigidly prescribed. Uh, think by way of contrast of caste-based societies. Um, at least the process was not determined by nature Nonetheless, as Hegel noted, <coughs> in 1817, a culture of separation still pervaded the Prussian nobility. There were problems with contemporary nobilities as far as he was concerned, especially the Russian one, which saw itself as rather haughtily above uh, hoi polloi, the regular members of, of society, just as been the case with uh, Roman patrician uh, societies. Even so, although uh, social position in modern Europe was partly uh, uh, governed by chance. It included a major element of personal preference. There was an element of personal preference. The pursuit of a trade or entry into a profession now involved an element of choice. This is a world historical transformation if you look at the past 7,000 years of human history. And by the way, that I Hegel was not a modern specialist. His period was the last 7,000 years. <laughs> Free choice likewise shaped the institution of the modern family. Commonly in the past, marriage had been a matter for parents to decide. More recently, the element of, reci of reciprocal love, love marriages were new, so more recently, the element of reciprocal love based on, as, he, as Hegel put it, the subjective, prin subjective principle of the modern world had come to predominate. We pick our partners. They're not handed to us. Okay. In addition to the gratification of appetite, marriage served a more enduring purpose, which included the rearing of children. Uh, of all political theorists of the you know, late early modern period, Hegel has the, the most detailed and sophisticated conception uh, of the family. Compare Hobbes, compare Rousseau, com compare everyone else. It's, it's a major part of his apparatus of analysis. Um, so nonetheless, at the same time, the modern family had to be distinguished from the notion of uh, lineage. Uh, 
In its modern guise, the value of the family was particularized in its present members instead of the idea of the stirps or the gens, the, the, the Roman tribe really, um, where the family was submerged in the attachment to posterity. So think of European aristocracies. It's the whole big fat family with its emblems that matters more than the little local family here, here, and, here and now. Under feudalism, with inheritance um, hemmed in by primogeniture and entails, uh, this more ancestral conception had been widespread. The splendor familiae, the, the greatness of the family, uh, the family line and its, and its renown outshone the nuclear unit characteristic of modern times, in other words, our society. Altogether, uh, contemporary society uh, in this vision, uh, contemporary society with its moral attitudes, its system of property, its form of work and family life, um, were not the product of a single revolutionary explosion. This didn't just happen in 1789. It was a big, long European development. Um, uh, so not a, a revolutionary explo ex explosion, but an expression of a general transformation in which, as it were, subjectivity achieved preeminent status. So by now it should be clear that for Hegel, subjectivity uh, defined the modern world. This was expressed in uh, the refinement of rights, the keenness of conscience, both religious and moral, and the practices of ethical life generally, in the sense that you obey your conscience rather than your superiors. As already noted, subjectivity shaped uh, um, attitudes to vocational roles and the outlook on marriage. It also changed uh, the principles determining selection to office, to political office. It corroded the idea of a state-based entitlement to rule. Aptitude rather than status became a qualification for government. Again, a world historical shift, worth bearing in mind the scale of it. Hegel was unstinting in drawing out the implications of this. So I quote him, individuals are not destined by birth or personal nature to hold particular office. On the contrary, knowledge and competence were key. This created opportunities for the cultivated middle class, the Mittelstand. In Hegel's view, a university trained bureaucratic elite was an essential component of the modern state. Officials had to be safeguarded against influence and dependence. Once supported in this way, uh, they were in a position to focus on universal aspects of affairs. In other words, to take within their purview the general preoccupations of society rather than their own um, interests. By this means, the norms of public duty could replace arbitrary authority. The civil servant uh, succeeded the errant um, um, early modern or, or feudal or medieval um, noble administrator wielding uh, power as a hobby, you might say. So equally for Hegel, rigorous administration ought to be answerable to the public. But he also thought that popular opinion ought to be channeled through the mechanisms of constitutional government. Sentiments needed to be distilled. To achieve that, circumspection, reflection, and deliberation were necessary. Hegel considered this an urgent matter under specific, specifically modern conditions. In, in those circumstances, pervasive self-interest and steep inequalities needed to be um, reconciled. So Hegel is a defender of the modern representative state and representative institutions. He did have issues with, with, um, with expanding um, differential opportunities in modern civil societies. So inequality was not a matter of indifference. So this uh, ad objective, the reconciliation of the high and the low, if you like, the, the, the luxuriant and the immiserated, uh, this objective had, to be objective had to be pursued against a particular background. Equality had become uh, the mantra of modern politics, post-1789, uh, essentially. Hegel believed, however, that the slogan equality, 
masked enormous differences. I mean, equality was the mantra, but of course world history had been a process of differentiation since bipedal existence in the savannah. The division of labor had taken place, so uh, the um, ambition of equality under conditions of extreme differentiation was going to be some kind of problem. So this required, as it were, um, deep thought. In effect, this meant that, that the, the word, as used by French revolutionaries, was an empty and misleading term. We might be equal in some sense, but there were, we were dramatically unequal, and necessarily so, in many other senses. It was quite correct, Hegel argued, uh, that from the vantage point of abstract right, each person was on a par with their, uh, fellow, uh, with their fellows um, uh, and their comrades and their competitors. Yet this perspective disregarded the individual's social position. As he wrote, equality in this case um, can only be the equality of abstract persons as such, right, so we would call it equality before the law, um, which thus excludes everything to do with possessions. In other words, this can't cover equality of property, right? Um, um, this basis of inequality, so that's where we get inequality from, right? Uh, differential property distribution, differential aptitudes, well, modern America. The goal of levelling was certainly an understandable wish, uh, Hegel thought, but a moral wish was no more than a baseless um, aspiration. If it was a purely immoral wish, it was no more than a baseless aspiration. Inequality spontaneously mer emerged in social life. Consequently, the only parity that could be guaranteed in terms of rights was the, e um, was, um, the equal entitlement to property, not equality of property, in other words. However, it was exactly this principle that yielded immense disparities in civil society. Modern economic relations multiplied desires and their satisfactions. Needs were dominated by the opinion of needs. So uh, we didn't used to need mobile phones, but now we seem to need them, right? So that's an opinion of a need. Um, uh, so this meant that specialized luxuries became ever more necessary in our minds. Skills, desires, and commodities were increasingly refined. The craving for a comfortable life gave rise to inexhaustible improvements. A lug as luxury spread, the diversity of fortunes expanded, and poverty became, uh, as we say, a systemic problem. The relative proximity of rich and poor, observable among the more frugal societies of the ancients, gave way to what Hegel called boundless extravagance on one side and dispiriting deprivation on another. The resulting struggle had to be moderated and conducted towards some notion of the common good. The common good couldn't be a matter of indifference under the modern state, or, or why have a state? That was how he saw it. So towards this end, civil society was charged with indemnifying rights, but also with promoting something like well-being. Um, the system of right, Hegel insisted, could result in harm. Markets needed security to ensure property and prosperity. Yeah, you couldn't ignore markets. Um, yet their interests should be subordinated to public utility. They couldn't determine everything in a society if, if it was to be a uh, society. It followed that adverse effects stood in need of correction. Hegel was clear that this should not be a matter for charitable donations merely, but for impersonal public oversight. By the way, not by the state, incidentally, but by corporations, interestingly enough. But that's, that's uh, another story. So um, um, even so, uh, poverty was a concern for civil society in general. Uh, as Hegel wrote, I have a right to demand that my particular welfare should be promoted. In other words, you can't say to your fellow, I, I know I share the state with you, but you're not my problem. That's, that there's something wrong with that, as far as Hegel's concerned. In the absence of uh, harmony, um, quote, an incipient divergence between public power and private interest would appear. People would become alienated from their state and think it's not serving them, so why should they be under this state? Uh, and this um, imperiled, as far as Hegel was concerned, the integrity of the state. To offset the threat, legislative and executive power would have to be streamlined, thereby avoiding the great defect 
in constitutional organization that maimed the French Revolution from the start. By the way, Hegel thought that the French Revolution, despite the literature, Hegel thought the French Revolution had been um, a failure. And by the way, not a failure in 1793, but a, a failure in the, su in the summer of 1789, because it failed to understand how it might organize um, its own constitution. Uh, the National Assembly uh, legislated, uh, and the monarch was supposed to execute. But then the National Assembly was executing, and what was the role of the monarch? And therein was triggered a civil war, which lasted until uh, the end of the 19th century. Uh, well, to offset, uh, um, uh, rather, so to begin with, uh, the fallacy in the uh, equation of the vox populi with the vox dei would have to be exposed. The notion that the, the voice of the people is the voice of God would have to be properly explored and understood. In other words, the notion that it's our state would have to be um, reconciled with the potential reality of, um, you know, um, mobbish um, um, assaults upon the state. So the people uh, were the origin of legitimacy in Hegel, but equally a source of potentially destructive power. As I say, he lived through the 1790s and observed uh, France. So to avoid a collision of opinions and the ensuing political mayhem, effective decision-making would have to be rooted in ministerial judgment. He was a believer in executive uh, power. Um, the actions of the, of the government would have to reflect the preferences uh, represented in an assembly of a state. So there'd have to be an effective executive, and the executive would have to be, in some sense, answer answerable to a legislative. Uh, the insights of, of delegates, delegates in a representative assembly, were essential for ascertaining the, the popular will, or in Hegel's phrase, the subjective consciousness of the people. It had to reflect our consciousness in, in some sense. Representatives should perform a critical function, holding, as I said, or as I've implied, the executive to account. But they should also compose a sort of mediating organ, um, relaying the attitudes of society. Now, th this may be obvious to us, but you have to remember, um, Germany's only, or the parts of Germany, are only transitioning to representative regimes at this time. In order to live up to that task, the assembly ought not to be populated by an aggregate of delegates, but by deputies from, from circles of interest organized into corporations. The alternative was the sovereignty of what Hegel called a formless mass, uh, um, which he then elucidated um, as being elemental, irrational, barbarous, and terrifying. He had in mind the mobs of revolutionary, revolutionary France. For Hegel, the French Revolution had unleashed this brand of malevolent uh, energy. The resulting fallout was a, not a model for imitation, but a lesson in what to avoid. So we've surveyed Hegel's conception of the Reichstadt, uh, along with its social conditions and implications. Yet the achievement of this presupposed a fundamental cultural shift. It assumed the sovereignty of reason over the forms of authority that prevail in theocratic and patriarchal societies. In ancient China, the emperor could refute the truths of the Mandarin class on the authority of his station. Similarly, the Catholic Church repudiated Galileo on the basis of dogmatic assertion. But since then, reasoned argument gained ascendancy over arbitrary declarations. This outcome was the work of what Hegel called the Enlightenment. For Hegel, the Enlightenment was a moment of epochal significance, I mean, for this reason alone. Ever since, the period has continued to enjoy a pivotal importance in the annals of Western historiography, and of course this is why. Hegel's outlook, as one might expect, was world historical in character. He thought that uh, monumental authority had been prized in ancient Egypt, just as the beauty of the polis had stood at the center of Athenian life. For the moderns, on the other hand, reason played a determining role. We can maybe discuss later what he meant by reason. The Enlightenment, accordingly, was the age of reason. Now, modern scholars have variously queried this conclusion. They've even questioned the existence of the Enlightenment as such. 
For some, like J.G.A. Pocock, the Enlightenment is best understood as a plurality of perspectives. That is, as Enlightenment's plural, instead of a single Enlightenment. For others, like the um, British scholar who nonetheless spent much of his career in the United States, J.C.D. Clark, the Enlightenment is nothing other than actually a belated construction, an historiographical fiction, if you like. Now, both conclusions, it seems to me, are unnecessarily agnostic. Clark's view, I think, is excessively historicizing. A strange complaint coming from me as an historian, but you'll get my point. The Enlightenment for him is, and I quote, a term of historiographical art, widely adopted in the Anglophone uh, discourse, only from the mid-20th century. First of all, uh, strictly speaking, uh, this is untrue. Since Hegel refers to the Aufklärung, the Enlightenment, and Hegelianism proved influential in Britain, Germany, and France, not to mention, of course, elsewhere. But Clark's procedure, in any case, would disqualify any historical depiction uh, which was not the self-characterization of the era under discussion. So we couldn't have the ancient world because they didn't call themselves the ancient world, and we couldn't have the Renaissance because they didn't call themselves the Renaissance, so we couldn't have an historiographical nomenclature at all. So there's a kind of procedural uh, problem there. So if, this, if Clark was right, then historians could parrot, but they couldn't describe. Um, well, along with John Robertson, I'm inclined to accept that the Enlightenment did, in fact, um, exist. Pocock's plurality, after all, presupposes a singular phenomenon, uh, which can, of course, be differentiated into multiple points of view, but you can't have many if the many isn't a many of something. Seems to be a logical uh, principle. So this, however, does not turn the Enlightenment into a movement or a doctrine. It clearly wasn't a movement. You can't have a movement with multiple personalities uh, radically opposing one another. And it can't be a doctrine if there's no single doctrine. So that's clear. Hegel's understand, uh, uh, understanding anticipated this very qualification that I just made. But it represented, um, uh, but it represented a period driven by controversy. I mean, Enlightenment is a period driven by controversy. And from this point of uh, vantage point, uh, the Enlightenment encompassed disagreement about Enlightenment, un un unsurprisingly. That is, it covered an era that was divided about the role of reason in society. While the Enlightenment in Hegel signaled a seismic shift, it was part of a longer trajectory embracing the era of Christian Europe. To analyze what had happened, Hegel resorted to a number of terms relevant to both the period and the process that drove it. We need to unpack the meaning of Hegel's terms. These include uh, enlightenment, aufklärung, as I've said, perfectibility, a term derived from Rousseau, which Hegel himself used, perfectibility, and culture, uh, sometimes appearing in German as Bildung and sometimes as Kultur. In Hegel, it's Bildung, in Kant, it's Kultur, for what it's worth. But we also need to consider the substance that underlies these concepts. Ultimately, Hegel wanted to probe the relationship between religion, uh, society, and the state. That's the point in this debate. He was above all preoccupied with the modern alignment between these forces by comparison with the situation in the ancient world. In practice, this impels him to address the limits of morality and government, where, where government should end and morality begin. But more, more recently, it, um, um, it had, um, sorry, morality um, historically had been the province of religion. That's what religion's for, teaching behavior, mostly, world historically. And we're dealing with Hegel, so it has to be world historical. Um, so more recently, however, morality had become the concern not simply and only of religion, but also of philosophy, uh, as was the case, it's true, also with the Greeks. Well, this now is becoming a concern of philosophy as well as religion. This generated competition between the domains, which in the end spelt conflict between the church and the universities. The Enlightenment debate about faith and knowledge was at bottom a dispute over the relationship between philosophy and religion. Viewed more expansively, this was a multi-dimensional contest 
owe the respective jurisdictions of faith, science, morals, and politics. These domains at least partly corresponded to particular institutions, the church, the university, and the state. Now, Kant had pondered relations between these bodies in the 1780s and 1790s. He argued that church and state dictated the terms of obedience to citizens, while the philosophical faculties of the university could criticize uh, their assumptions. So they could criticize but not command obedience. In other words, philosophy could scrutinize while uh, government could enforce. When Hegel addressed the problems bequeathed by the Enlightenment, he was entering into this very controversy. But in doing so, he was resuming a quarrel whose coordinates had changed since the era of Frederick the Great. I mean, the French Revolution had happened for a start. So first in France, a moral revolution against the state had taken place, and that's how Hegel saw the French Revolution, uh, as a moral revolution. And because it was a moral evangelical revolution rather than a political revolution, or a moral evangelical revolution in the midst of a state, uh, trying to conquer the state, uh, that's incidentally uh, why it failed. Well, its ramifying consequences dominated the European scene for the whole of Hegel's adult life, 1770 to 1831 are, are, are his dates. Second, partly as a consequence of the revolution, a representative constitutional regime moved to the center of uh, political discussion in Germany in the wake of the Napoleonic Wars. So Kant didn't have to figure out the relationship between um, um, state religion and church in the midst of uh, an emerging, an emerging um, you know, uh, representative assembly. So Kantian philosophy had largely focused on the relationship between ethical reform and, um, and um, enlightened monarchy. By comparison, Hegel's thoughts came to concentrate on grounding moral opinion in the context of, of a representative regime. In the most general terms, Hegel regarded religion and politics as serving overlapping objectives, okay? So religion and politics serve overlapping objections, um, objectives rather. Each of them was a means of realizing what he called the absolute, best translated for us probably as value, just value, just think value and you've got as absolute, or supreme value, because if you've got a system of values, you must have a highest value, so, okay. So they both served I mean, it's quite simple. They both served our value system, both religion and politics. So they've got a similar preoccupation. This meant that they were charged with advancing supreme value within a given historical con constellation. What was absolute in cultural life was normativity itself, constructed by society over time in pursuit of the desire for freedom. That, in a sentence, is Hegelian philosophy, by the way. However, Hegel also noted that religion and politics serve the absolute in vitally distinct ways, okay? Shared objective, they're not the same thing though. As far as he was concerned, recent conservative polemic in Germany had collapsed both enterprises, that's to say church and state or religion and politics, into a single project, as if religion should determine the shape and purpose of the state, in other words, the church telling the government what to do. Hegel thought that reducing politics to religion, reducing it to religion, would one ha have one of two dire uh, results. It would either take the form of what he termed polemical piety and lead to attempts to abolish power in the name of moral purity. He has the English Civil Wars in, in mind here, and in a certain way, the French Revolution too. Or else it would strive to extinguish individualism in favor of unaccountable authority, a kind of world papacy, if you like. And he's a Southern German Protestant, by the way. The first essentially was a species of what the Enlightenment called enthusiasm, the second a kind of superstition, and he was clearly against both. Hegel took up these problems in the context of his theory of the state, beginning at paragraph 257 of the philosophy of right. Now, I want to focus in the concluding portion of this lecture on the issues that arrive, arise in this section of Hegel's text. The crux of his account of the relations between church and state is packed into paragraph 270 in particular. Ultimately, Hegel's treatment here branches out into an examination of politics and education. He indicated that education embraced two poles, the church 
and the university. The university included religion, given that, of course, there's a faculty of theology, but it also embraced science um, or Wissenschaft, so not natural science, but we call it academic learning, which in turn had at least two components. Physical, we call it physics, uh, or we call it science, actually, um, and, and speculative science, or empirical study and philosophy, by the way, which included history. Uh, the philosophical faculty was, we call it the arts, right? Given the diverse elements constituting religion, science, and politics, Hegel endeavoured to figure out the interconnections between these components. He began by noting the dual nature of modern political regimes. The state, he wrote, is both the universal interest as such and the conservation of particular interests within the universal interest. As we just say, it is, is the, the state and our private rights. It's both. It has to juggle both these things. Its achievement is that it manages both these things. In other words, a constitutional polity of the modern kind had to serve the general interest. It was to that extent a collective enterprise. However, at the same time, the modern state was characterised in terms of its enhancement of individual interests. Right? Um, so individual interests express themselves in diverse ways. First, they comprise the sphere of civil society. We've dealt with that. But second, they were often composed into subordinate associations, churches offering an obvious example. For Hegel, religion should operate freely under the state so long as it did not collide with the state's fundamental values. The church had its doctrine, as did the state. The former had to be reconciled on terms stipulated by the latter. In the case of irreconcilable doctrines, for example, Anabaptism, uh, Quakerism and Judaism, his examples from early 19th century Germany, toleration should be practised. Toleration, in turn, presupposed the robustness of the state, not so much toleration in Iran, for instance. Not a very robust state, if you liberalise it. Both church and state were spiritual enterprises for Hegel. It was a mistake, he thought, to regard the church as the soul of the constitution, while politics was left to deal mechanistically merely with material needs. As I said, it's a vehicle for our values uh, too. Geist for Hegel meant uh, consciousness. Nothing more mysterious than that. Forget about the literature. That's what it means. And consciousness uh, spawned uh, the human environment, inclusive of all ecclesiastical um, and political establishments. Moreover, the modern state was not simply a product of, of consciousness or our attitudinal, affective and intellectual life, we might just say. Not, not, uh, not only that, it was also a function of self-consciousness. In other words, um, our state is a vehicle for our interests and our values, uh, but the state also, and this may sound strange, but it'll make sense in a minute, the state also reflects upon itself. After all, what else does the legislature do? So uh, it also had self-consciousness. In other words, the modern state was more than a creature of happenstance just embodied in, in customs. It was also the outcome of deliberate self-awareness in uh, public life. So given the reality of constitutional design, uh, bureaucratic planning and legislation, the various branches of the state reflected on their activities. The state, as Hegel put it, knows what it wills, uh, at least we hope it does. Uh, legislation, for example, is not a matter of merely, as it were, uh, reactive or um, customary responsive uh, behaviour. It is instead a species of self-conscious action. It comprises, we hope, thought, uh, foresight uh, and deliberation. These are all cognitive activities of the human being and they're a form of the state reflecting upon itself, as I said. In addition, in addition, the university reflects upon what the state does, right? For Hegel, the university, like the church, was a means to education. It was, in effect, a form of socialization. But he also regarded the university and the church as essentially ends in themselves. I mean, they're not subordinate to the state. They should not be governed by the state, um, and nor should they seek to govern society. It's not an activist venture. Well, not always. There is a distinction to be drawn, in other words, between education and administration. 
The, uh, this observation now brings me to uh, my final point. For Hegel, in the end, um, science, or Wissenschaft, academic, culture, must take the lead in education. He thought that religion certainly involved cognition brought about through learning. However, its precepts were largely symbolic in nature for him. True religion enlightens, but it's not sufficient for enlightenment. As Hegel argued, faith in any liberal regime must be supplemented by knowledge. But knowledge, as crystallized in the modern state, was the province of philosophy and not the church, as indicated by my earlier reference to Galileo. In the 19th century, the centrality of knowledge brought politics into a deepening relationship with universities, uh, ever, ever deeper, 45% of the populations educated by them. Their alliance, of course, might easily descend into conflict. Equally, philosophy might fail to reconcile various academic disciplines, pitting, say, the sciences against the humanities. These things are possible. Such battles grew in intensity in the final quarter of Hegel's life, actually, especially during the period of the, of the Karlsbad degrees, when you know, the, the Prussian state started to try and control public opinion, including universities, including uh, imprisoning some of Hegel's students. So especially in that era, the state, religion, and the university jostled for position. Given the continuance of some of these struggles in our time, it seems clear that we're still living to that extent in the shadow of Hegel's enlightenment. But despite this heritage, our conception of where we now stand is not altogether clear. Over the past 50 years, the vague equation of knowledge and power in various sectors of the humanities is not especially politically clarifying. If knowledge is power, then why should the university not just behave like a state? Or the government, in response, not just dictate to the university? The crude category of all, of all enveloping power does not leave much room for distinctions between powers, what we call the separation of powers. Similarly, beginning around the end of World War II, some have come to regard enlightenment as basically totalitarian. In fact, that phrase appears in Theodore Adorno and Max Horn Horkheimer's book on the Enlightenment. Well, this again is a rather crudely, I hope we can now agree, crudely mononithic approach. Pache, Adorno and Horkheimer, distinctions between myth, religion and science matter unless you think they're all the same thing, which is implicitly the argument of their book. As I've been implying, in line actually with Hegel's claims, the epistemic status of knowledge claims um, are key for distinguishing truth from power. As we've seen, such differentiation was a precondition for the very possibility of a Rechstadt, as well as the ideal of civil equality. So these values today are pillars of what most people think of as liberalism, broadly conceived. Contemporary liberalism undoubtedly stands in need uh, of criticism. Most things do. But criticism should not sacrifice the edifice as a whole um, without the lineaments of the Rechstadt and the values of a free society. It is hard to see how progress of any kind can be achieved. Thanks very much. Splendid and enlightening lecture, <laughs> recovering, um, recovering Hegel for us as a seminal constitutional thinker. Professor Richard Burke is now going to take questions for about 20 minutes uh, or so, 25 minutes. Um, so who would like to begin? We have a question here from Professor David McPherson. Is it hot? All right. All right, well, thank you very much for that lecture. So, I was so your general argument seems to be pushing Hegel sort of in a more liberal direction, or, s or sort of a friend of liberalism, we might say. Um, and I wonder um, how you might um, place your interpretation of Hegel with the debates starting in the 1980s between sort of communitarians like uh, Charles Taylor, uh, who of course wrote a big, big book on Hegel, uh, Michael Sandel, Alistair McIntyre, and others, uh, and on the other hand, sort of liberals like John Rawls, uh, more in the Kantian tradition, Whereas the, the communitarians were often drawing on Hegel and um, Aristotle to try to make a case for, uh, you know, certain flaws within uh, sort of 
whether it be the anthropology of liberalism, such as the atomism, or what uh, Michael Sandel calls the unencumbered self. So one of the sort of insights it seems like that they're pushing towards is the idea that um, uh, free freedom comes about through sort of unchosen obligations. In fact, we're, we're encumbered selves, and I think we see this, you know, in Hegel on the cyclicite, uh, the sort of the ethical community, custom, right? Uh, maybe even Burkean prejudice, we might say. Um, and then the other hand, sort of the, the priority of the good over the right. Uh, and I think, I do think we see those themes in Hegel. I'm curious what you think. I mean, because uh, you might see it as like he's trying to raise up or fulfill certain kinds of ideals of liberalism, because he tends to be the sort of, you got this, you know, the sort of an thesis and antithesis, and then you try to raise it up. Uh, and I think in certain ways, some of the communitarians, I think especially like Charles Taylor and mm -hmm. Michael Sandel, at least maybe not McIntyre, are trying to kind of elevate or achieve the goods that are implicit mm -hmm. while maybe avoiding some of, some of the bad aspects. So anyways, I was just curious how, um, how you see your interpretation of Hegel kind of in conversation with those, those debates starting in the 80s. So thanks, thanks again for the lecture. Great, thanks so much. Well, um, you raise a lot of important issues. And I should say at the outset that um, there's two things I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not doing. I, I'm not um, wanting to intervene in a debate about um, the history and historical origins uh, and historical nature uh, of liberalism. I mean, I, I'd happily talk about that, but that's not what I'm doing here because that's um, ramifying, complex, and you know, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of history. So what I wanted to say was, uh, okay, e even Hegel doesn't think he's a partisan of, of liberalism, that's, that's clear. Liberalism for him is the Napoleonic Europe. You, you conquer, you impose um, a rights-based uh, constitution, uh, you've no answerability to a population, uh, and you've no mechanisms of political accountability. He's against that, and that's what he calls liberalismus. So in the technical historical sense, he, he's clearly not a liberal. Um, but liberalism means many things, and I, I, I just wanted to stand back and say, okay, uh, this is not a left-right right point, this is not a, a, a communitarian versus something else, but all of us um, in the modern liberal constitutional democratic polities, we would all consider the following features as having something to do with, with liberalism. We would think it, it requires a representative regime. We would think that it re requires some notion of private property. It requires some notion of um, um, that there is a, a tribunal of truth over and against state power, right, and so on and so forth. So if we, if we agree upon that, as it were, it's a Weberian point, if we agree upon that ideal type, and um, we can discuss what goes in there and what should not go in there, that's, you know, but I was just trying to be broad brush strokes. Then Hegel has contributed to discussion of many of these elements because he was a partisan of civil, uh, civil society, a defender of private property, a defender of personal choice in marriage, a defender of a choice of a vocation. So he, he's to that extent part of our modern liberal world, not completely, uh, but to that extent. Um, and um, therefore I'm interested in his analysis, the emergence of, of these things. So to that extent, he's part of the, the, as it were, the history uh, of liberalism, but I wasn't trying to um, associate him with a particular 19th century movement or, 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 or doctrine. Um, secondly, about um, the specific sort of, I guess, 1970s, 80s debates between, uh, say, Sandel and Rawls, um, uh, Taylor and McIntyre, of course, d different characters, but anyway, communitarianism against, as it were, the unencumbered self or, or a sort of individualism. Um, there's a lot to be said there. Um, I, I slightly myself think um, uh, Taylor, who's a very important uh, Hegel scholar, um, th theologized Hegel in ways that are problematic and, you know, for, for what it's worth, I think, you know, Pippin and Brandham are other and others are, are, are right that Taylor's interpretation is just clearly not right there. Um, but really, that's not your point. Your point is about this wider issue of the priority of, of community over right in sort of 1980s political theory in the United States and how Hegel might um, feed, feed into that. Um, that's a big question, of course. Um, I mean, maybe perhaps the best shortest answer is just to say Hegel's a part partisan of the institutions, the market and private property, but he doesn't think their rights are so absolute as to potentially destroy the state. And therefore, there is a question of welfare in relation to right. Um, and I suppose Taylor is picking up on that. 
and Sandel is, is picking up on that, and therefore they're, they're, pick, they're, they're opposed to Rawls's neo-Kantianism, although Rawls's neo-Kantianism is not very Kantian, because Kant believed absolutely in the supreme rights of, the, of property without qualification, and the rest can be left to charity sort of thing. So he Hegel is different um, from that, and, um, and so is Rawls himself. So, um, so a lot there, but anyway, that's where I'm going with this. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, I guess the question is basically, how did liberalism come about? Like, moreover, let's say, that, like a normatively structured government, like s helps us to treat humans like equally, and like understand them as equals. Or well, like, how did we know to, um, you know, abolish noble titles or, like, to like get rid of slavery and then like create that normatively structured government? Does the point make sense? Yes, so I suppose um, your question is Hegel's question for himself. How did this all um, come about? How did we end up with um, a system of rights which didn't exist in medieval, uh, it's not that there are no rights, but there isn't an organized system of comprehensive, comprehensive equality um, of rights. How did um, our forms of political accountability emerge? How did the notion that slavery is abomination emerged when massive slices of world history are premised on the legitimacy of slavery, just by the way. Um, why were um, titles um, sacrificed and the notion of um, um, government based on competence rather than entitlement? Well, th that's the story he's telling, and it's not one wave, as it were. It's um, um, a series of reinforcing, overlapping, developments without a plan. Uh, I suppose the important thing to emphasize is Hegel goes down as a sort of teleologician. Uh, I believe this is um, uh, a mistake. That's not what Hegel is saying, that there's some predetermined outcome in history. Rather, there is human struggle, which without a plan um, has, as it were, dialectically, um, evolved these uh, systems that we call uh, the modern liberal constitutional state. Um, so it's, it's not planned, not predetermined, but one can chart its emergence, largely as a product of unintended consequences. I mean, it, his phrase is, um, uh, list der Vernunft, the cunning of reason, by which he just means something like the invisible hand. That's to say, an unplanned, unplanned benign outcome. So that's his whole, that is his vision, uh, your question. So read more Hegel. <laughs> and more questions. We have one, we have two questions in the front. So let's take one in the back since the microphone is there and then we come to the front. Hi, um, Les Teal from the political science department here where I teach political theory. So one of the ways that sometimes we suggest it's worthwhile to teach the great books and the great minds of that tradition is to suggest that they have things to teach us about our current issues and predicaments. And so I want to put that question to you with regards to Hegel. Um, <clears throat> we're given to understand that he has an understanding of a progressive arc of history that sharply inflects upwards with the Enlightenment. And we've heard that sort of notion before with Daniel Bell speaking of the end of ideology and Fukuyama, the end of history, and then some some reactions to that suggesting that things don't always seem to bend so sharply upwards of progressivist arc. Um, so today we live in a time where, um, you know, populism's on the rise, as is authoritarianism across the globe, um, cults of personality, um, very much um, in the opposite direction of the things that you suggest Hegel was suggesting the Reichstadt represents. So I'm wondering what you would suggest Hegel has to teach us today about what seems to be some bumps in that arc of history bending sharply upwards. Very good, thank you. Uh, um, so first about things uh, to teach us, uh, so that the classics teaching us, um, or great books teaching us, or nuggets of wisdom in great books which teach us. Um, that's um, um, 
a difficult area to address in uh, the history of political thought because since the 1960s, um, there's been you know, challenges to that very notion. That's to say, um, if thinkers are put in their historical context, then they're so divorced from us that they couldn't conceivably speak to us as one school. But on the other hand, there are other schools about, as I say, the, 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 the sort of nuggets of, of, of wisdom. And I'm slightly in neither of those camps. Um, I, I'm more inclined to think um, that um, Hegel helps teach us about his period, which helps teach us about where we are, rather than simply, as it were, extracting the jewels from the wreckage. That's, broadly speaking, um, my uh, preference. Um, we could go on about that, but, um, but I'll just leave it there. About the pr progressive arc, um, that's a tricky point because, um, as I said, Hegel doesn't think that there's a necessary, predetermined progressive arc, right? So there is no arc either because the, the, the dialectic is not a linear, a linear development. Um, so it's not really a progressive arc. However, um, um, do we affirm the outcome as um, normatively preferable to uh, um, ancient Chinese despotism, um, the ancient um, Indian caste system, um, the slavery of the Romans, um, uh, the feudal church, um, you know, or do we affirm our world as normatively necessary? The final key two words in the, in the final paragraph of the phenomenology are to contingency and necessity. And I think his point is, this has happened contingency, uh, contingently, of course. Otherwise, he'd just be a Leibnizian character telling us there's been a master plan and he's seen it. Uh, so I believe he thinks it's contingent, but nonetheless, it's now for us necessary. Um, history itself, Hegel says, has been a schlachtbank, a slaughter bench. There's nothing attractive about it. It's blood and guts. It's been a, an abomination. But the, the fact is, somehow, we are capable of saying um, that, for instance, um, rational rules of evidence can challenge a ruler that says um, bleach cures COVID. Science can refute the charisma of personality. Now, that's not the case for most of world history where charisma trumps procedure and rationality. So um, um, if you accept that, let's just say, modern science has acquired a particular authority for the human being, and modern moral sensibility is not uh, answerable to an, um, to, um, an ayatollah, um, right? Which were all you know, norms in world history. Then you can see we have carved out a possibility which um, we will not relinquish. And if we're saying we will not relinquish, we're saying it's normatively necessary for us. And I think Hegel is closer to that. Uh, and um, that's what's interesting about him. If he were um, just saying uh, there's a plan, it's all happened, and um, history is smiling upon us, um, then I think it would be a piece of n n naive optimism. But I don't think that's fully what he's saying. Thanks. Excellent question from the front. Thank you. Um, maybe there was a partial answer in what you just said, no. but I was trying to understand a little more clearly. Yes. Would you, were you thinking that Hegel thought the Thermidor was an inevitability or some kind of inevitability, that, that there was no way that revolution was going to succeed in the way they had planned it and that the terrors would have happened in his imagination or his philosophy? Yeah, great. Uh, well, uh, first of all, um, strictly speaking, despite his reputation, um, some of which derives from um, the Marxisant um, appropriation of Hegelianism, iron laws, or Leninistic, really, iron laws of history. As a result of this, and the complexity of Hegel's own prose, partly resulting from the fact that um, in the 1790s in Germany, a highly specialized philosophical vocabulary was developed because they're all responding to Kant, A, and B, because his religious views, occupying uh, a position in a Lutheran university, uh, the University of Berlin, are unorthodox. Therefore, there isn't uh, what you'd call lucidity in the prose uh, of, of Hegel. 
Um, as a result, he's a prime target for misreading. My own view is there is no inevitability in Hegel, uh, which would be a sort of the equivalent of God makes history and we can see that and so we know, uh, okay. So that, 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 that's not there. Um, but nonetheless, he did think the French Revolution had, as it were, in all probability, set itself up for, um, for failure because it was um, a, a moral rebellion against the world. That's how he, he, he saw it. In other words, it was a sort of um, a scream against circumstances. But his practical view is, it's, no, it's not possible having any politics unless you work with circumstances, right? So he saw the French Revolution as a sort of moral leap into the void, which tried to abolish the conditions of change in order to make change. But you can't abolish the conditions of change if you're gonna make change. Um, by the way, he thought that was the mistake of Christianity in the first instance. Uh, Jesus was a moral revolution. Um, uh, without the means of um, e uh, um, evangelical takeover, because all there was was a small brotherhood, but for effective change in an era in which there's, there's, there's a state, um, uh, you're gonna end up needing you know, forces like a church, and then the church became very unlike the, um, the voice of Jesus, and then there was a reformation. So Hegel's view of the failure of moral insurgency partly comes from his reading of the travails of, of, of Christianity. So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. Um, I guess very briefly, my question sort of holds the same theme as the yeah. previous two questions, but during Hegel's life in particular, as he was observing you know, oppressive dogmas and oppressive states become abating, yeah. and as the resurgence of individual sovereignty and confidence, um, did he perceive any sort of threats to this sort of liberalization? For example, maybe was he making any proto-Marxist observations about the social structure and whether oppression may have been originated or caused by some other source yes. in that matter? Yeah, very good. Threats, yes, many, nothing but threats. Hegel, uh, in you know the the 1810s, said, I "I've spent the last um, 20 odd years of my life oscillating violently between hope and fear." So that's Hegel, right? Oscillating violently between hope and fear. There's no complacency in Hegel. There's no complacency in Hegel. The threats are multiple. Uh, the threats are uh, constitutional instability, and the threats are the polarities of uh, rich and poor, and especially. Uh, radical immiseration, uh, which will alienate, this is what attracted Marx, uh, alienate a class of, um, you know, uh, disenfranchised, what's called in this country, losers. But you can't have systemic losers in a successful polity, is his view. So th there are tre tremendous threats. There's no mistake about that. But here's the important question. Nonetheless, despite the precarity, as we might say, um, does history have any justification? Or is it a, is it a swirling, incoherent um, froth of chance with no meaning? Now, uh, history can't ask that last question, but philosophy must address it. Um, now, if the latter obtains that it's um, a tale of, um, um, a tale of ma 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 madness and fury with no significance whatsoever, um, Hegel's question coming out of the Kantian tradition is, is there any point in moral agency then? Why, why bother? And if it's a, and by the way, this is what actually fundamentally draw, drove Rawls's project too. If it's a why bother situation, you end up in a Carl Schmittian or Nietzschean, it's like, je m'en fiche, as the French say, what the hell? Uh, and if that's the case, you just might as well, as Heidegger did, leap one way or another. You know, the existential leap. I mean, we, we, you know, hope is redundant, and therefore just, just leap, and we know how Heidegger leapt. So there are definitely, this is what we m need to bear in mind. So in the end, there is justification in, in Hegel. Justification despite the Schlachtbank, despite the, the uh, slaughter bench. There is a slaughter bench, there is justification, but we must bear in mind the alternatives to that argument, which are Foucauldian, Nietzschean, Schmittian, and by the way, most with a far-right provenance. Um, so, um, so that's why Hegel has to be taken seriously, not because he's some sort of character out of a Voltaire novel. novel. Everything is fine, you know, that's not his point. His point is, ponder for a moment, you know, is there a world historical achievement 
and it seemed duh, there is. So there's some justification there. We must be worried, of course, about threats to that. A comet can hit tomorrow. You know, he accepts modern science. That can happen. Uh, but meantime, is the justification? Um, yes. Okay, final question from Professor Anna Sula. Thank you so much for this talk. It's very interesting. Um, you suggest that there isn't really a teleology in Hegel, I think is what you're, what you're saying. And I know that this contradicts some of the historiography on the subject. I'm just wondering, I'm curious what you would say to his, um, you know, the philosophy of history where he begins, I always wanted to begin my lectures this way, saying to know, to hear my history lectures is to know the mind of God. Providence is going to be exposed in this class, you know, that sort of thing. Yes. And, um, and also, so I guess I'm most familiar with this text, um, how he says, you know, history goes from east to west. Uh, the natural, you know, like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, so also human freedom begins in the east and sets in the west. So it almost suggests this kind of moving towards a pinnacle, providence, providential history. I'm wondering what you, I mean, maybe this is an outlier in his work? Is that maybe what yeah. you're suggesting? I'm yeah. uh, just curious yes. about that. Yeah, ve ve very good point. So I need to say two things. One, um, the lectures on the philosophy of, of world history um, are standardly available in the um, Sibri uh, translation edition, which is itself um, uh, a translation of Hegel's son's edition. Um, now, the problem with 19th century editions is they're not editions, which is to say, Hegel gave his, history, his lectures on the philosophy of world history um, five times over his career. What we would do as modern editors is give the, um, the 1822 lectures, and then we would give the 1824 lectures. Then we this has not been available in the German or English language uh, until very recently. So it's only since, the, since around about 2015 that we have a modern edition, and that's only in German, not in English. So, so there is a scholarly problem there, that, that previously these were jumbled together into a statement rather than um, providing material with which we could produce, you know, um, um, a faithful representation. However, uh, that doesn't fully answer your question because it's not as though none of these phrases are in even scholarly works. Um, but there is an important point about Hegel is lecturing to a Lutheran audience and by the way, Fichte was fired um, for a particular unorthodox view of Christianity in Jena in the late 1790s, fired. Um, it's definitely the case if you challenge the tenets of Lutheranism at the University of Berlin in um, 1822, it's game over. Right. So um, Hegel must, must reconcile his statements with, with, with a providential uh, view because Christianity means some species of providence. Of course, providence doesn't mean providence is scrutable. It might be inscrutable, just incidentally. And if it's inscrutable, then there might be a teleology, but we've no access to it. Um, my, my, my own view is that um, Hegel is reconciling... Um, look, Hegel is not anti-religious. He thinks uh, human beings are religious animals. World history is religious. The philosopher must reconcile uh, their doctrines with a, with a religious worldview or... You just repeat the error of the French Revolution of sort of screaming blasphemy at, um, you know, at a religious world and then it will take revenge upon you. Um, so he does want a reconciliation. In fact, that's what Verzunung reconciliation means in Hegel. We must have a rapprochement with, uh, with the world. You know, we, Platonism didn't work. It's a beyond the world. Uh, we must have a rapprochement with the world. And the now world is a Christian world. and There must be a rapprochement. But I don't, so despite these statements in Hegel, my, my own reading, uh, but by the way, uh, you know, uh, I'm not a loner here. I'm not a loner. That, you know, there is, other scholars agree. Um, of course there is the some teleology in the sense that we are purposeful agents and we try to make history. So there is our intentionality there. Of course, it doesn't succeed because we're thwarted by the historical process. So therefore, it's not technically um, a teleology. There is an outcome to be approved. That's right, so we approve the outcome. Um, but the alternative is not approve the outcome. And which are, which are you in favor of? Theocracy or patriarchy or slavery? I mean, broadly speaking, it's a kind of uncontroversial thesis. We have overcome, we have overcome these um, 
abominations. Um, so um, there is an affirmation in Hegel, I would say not a complacent one. So there is a, a sort of a telos, by its way, it's not an end of history, but there is, we've landed here and we don't want to go backwards into a caste-based societies where, you know, you're, you're born a weaver, so you weave, right. Um, so there is that affirmation and there is that achievement, but there's a difference between uh, a telos that's an outcome and a teleology, which is a determined outcome. That's the way I put it. But the, the, some of the phrasing you mentioned is there and it requires exegesis. And there's my, my very brief attempt at how the exegesis is complicated. Right. Okay. So I think our time is up. So that's a great, um, rather optimistic note to end on, I, I, I think. Um, but before we leave and buy our own copy of Richard's splendid book, let's thank him again for a splendid lecture. <laughs>